Lord Jesus, you have given us the consolation of the truth. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd leading us into everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy in us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. We have gathered here, dear friends, to remember the loved ones who died on these streets around this church in the Ballymurphy Massacre to highlight once more, as you have all done so faithfully and with long suffering, the unspeakable injustice perpetrated against your family members, your friends, your neighbours, our parishioners. Murdered on the 9th of August 1971 in cold blood, Old soldier in the Royal Green Jackets in the summer of '69. We had been ordered back from leave. We flew from RAF Lynham in C 130 transport and we arrived here at Ballykelly, Northern Ireland. expected to assist the civil authorities in keeping the peace because of the trouble that we'd seen on TV in London Day. And we moved off into Belfast uh, in late August 1969. I arrived here in Ballykelly Air Base on a cold March day in 1972. I was just 18 just finished training with the Royal Green Jackets. We were the new boys here. Unknown territory. We didn't know what to expect. This is the, the transport hub of Ballykelly Air Base. This map must have been here for decades. When we arrived here in Ballykelly, a couple of days later, we went down to Derry, and later that year, we went across here to Belfast. 
what we found was that Belfast was divided in sectarian terms. The east of the city was predominantly Protestant. And in the, the western side of the city and the north of the city, you had enclaves of Catholic communities in Ardoin, further one in the Lower Falls. But uh, one of the main areas where we felt that there were difficulties uh, was here in Bally Murphy. Bally Murphy back in those days was seen as a Catholic ghetto. There was a lot of poverty, unemployment. A lot of people just didn't have anything. There, there was nothing for the people. And basically hadn't much of a chance of getting a job either because you were a Catholic. In the shipyard, impossible. The aircraft factory, impossible. Sirocco works, impossible. And he didn't ask you if you're a Celtic or a Protestant. What they asked you was, what school did you go to? And that was enough. And the way they got out of it then was be saying, right, um, I'm sorry you haven't been successful on the day, but we'll keep your, your name on file, which quickly went down the bin. And that's your last you ever heard of it. Well, the church, the presence of the church here has been, I'm afraid, not as great as it could have been. You have an individual... When I first came to Valley Murphy in the mid-60s, I was horrified and I couldn't believe my eyes. I was very angry about the level of poverty and neglect of people. And yet, at the same time, I found that this district had more people doing more for their own dignity than any place I'd seen in Belfast so far. It looked bad, Bella Murphy. But to me, it was uh, the best place to be. That's me in the grey uniform, my school uniform. I was like a 13-year-old girl at the time. I loved Bella Murphy. But those were the good times, right yeah. before 1971. This is the happy times. We used to come up here, me and my friends, and play knockadors, knockadors and run away. <laughs> and they used sometimes you would have got a wee chase. See, that's it. That's, that's okay. good memories before the troubles really took hold. At 9, 10, 11, 12 years of age, I just knew that something wasn't right. At a certain time of the year, we had to pretend to be not either Catholics or, or from Balmurphy, and that was usually the margin season. Protestant families put their Union Jacks and their orange boat down out and all that there. And for the month of July, the kids wouldn't play with us. And I said, well, look, what's a crack here? You know, what's happening? I was aware that we weren't like every other society or like every other community. That's what I was aware of. For generations, the sectarian geography of Belfast has ebbed and flowed along with the politics of division that have defined this city. Divisions which were institutionalized in 1921. When demands for Irish independence became overwhelming, Britain partitioned the country creating a Catholic majority free state in the south. But it held on to the six counties in the northeast, a new state it called Northern Ireland. A state designed with a built-in Protestant majority, fiercely loyal to Britain 
and deeply distrustful of the Catholic minority. They discriminated against Catholics in terms of jobs in public housing. The police and a paramilitary force called the Beast Specials were dominated by Protestants. In the Beast Specials case, no Catholics were allowed to actually join. Northern Ireland's electoral boundaries were drawn to favour Protestants and economic qualifications introduced to disadvantage Catholics. Effectively, a Catholic vote was worth less than a Protestant one. So even Derry, Northern Ireland's second city, always elected a Protestant or Unionist council, despite having a Catholic majority. In the mid-60s, uh, the level of, of indignation and anger began to rise and people demanded their human rights. What was happening in America particularly was of tremendous importance uh, to people here. Even the music and the songs uh, that people sang in America and elsewhere, they were taken on here one person per vote. That became the cry of the people. I lived in Derry from 1966 to 1968, so I was one of the demonstrators. It was quite an interesting thing to, if not exactly be sort of part of, because I was a sort of Protestant who happened to be a student there. But to see the authority and the power and the self-organization of these ordinary people the people were not looking for um, a revolution. They were not looking for um, a change of, of government. They were looking for civil rights and equality within the British system. But any initiative by people in an area like ours was looked upon with suspicion. To be detrimental to your safety, to continue this march, this march will not continue. Any call for civil rights uh, was really a subversive plot. Then the police were able to attack civil rights marches and really beat them into the ground. Civil rights demonstrators in a march from Belfast to Londonderry were today attacked by angry loyalist crowds near Ben Tollett Bridge. They all battered us, and they took the single, they took the fella singly, and they battered him, and then they came for another they fella, and then they battered us, right, you know. Many of the attackers were identified as off-duty officers from the Protestant police auxiliaries, the B Specials. Loyalist opposition to the civil rights movement was very similar to the way many poor whites reacted in the United States, because they were one step up the ladder from the Catholics, just as the poor whites were one step up the ladder from the black people. And they didn't want to fall down. In August 69, a loyalist parade marched provocatively along Derry's ancient city walls, overlooking the poor Catholic Bogside estate. But when Loyalists marched down towards the Bogside, serious rioting erupted. What followed was a three-day battle in which the police were driven out by nationalist youth and the Bogside declared a no-go area for the security forces. So Free Derry was actually born and barricades were sort of put up to stop these uh, forces, whether it was the Loyalist mobs or the Unionist police forces entering the areas of the Borg side. This is Radio Free Dairy broadcasting on 300 meters medium wave band. Free Dairy's no-go area became at once a potent symbol of resistance for nationalists and Catholics and an insurrectionary threat to the Protestants and Loyalists. Riots broke out all across Northern Ireland, and in Belfast, the B-Specials and the police, the RUC, 
went on the offensive. In their wake, hundreds of people, mostly Catholics, were burnt out of their homes by loyalist mobs. The beast specials led them, and they come on the radio and television and say that there was a... Uh, we were shooting the machine gun dust. All those well, people... did you shoot back? Well, it was with pea shooters. At the time, the old IRA had largely committed to a political programme, and most, though not all, of its weapons were out of use. In 1969, the IRA were criticised by their own community, having been unable to prevent the incursions where houses had been burned down, replied with the fact that they simply didn't have any weapons available. There was a lot of graffiti in those days aimed at the official Republican movement with such things as IRA, I ran away. When the police were found to be not uh, only not protecting people, but were actually leading mobs into streets and um, helping them to burn the houses. This, of course, was terribly dangerous for us who had watched things in Europe happening during the 30s, and Germany and Spain. I remember on the night of the 14th of August, 15th of August, I was up in the attic of my granny's house at the top end of Crumlin Road, and it seemed as if all of Belfast was burning. I was 11, 12 years of age, watching the city in which I lived in seemingly come apart. All these streets full of Catholic houses were all burnt out. And I remember that there was a sense of fear about the place, what's going to happen, what's going to be next. Many Catholic families came to Balmurphy for refuge and for security. And one of the places that they ended up seeking refuge in this area was in St. Thomas's Secondary School in the White Dark Road. Do you remember in 69, Rita, when they burnt the people out in the Bombay Street in the Lower That's Falls? Right. That's and right. They all come up here to St. Thomas's. I remember having to come around and help. They were lined up here, mattresses, mattresses, yeah. all different families, women, children, men. Yeah. We were a safe haven, haven then, then, so we were. The violence by both sides was spiralling out of control, and the Unionist forces of law and order were compromised and exhausted. The British government, running out of options, decided to act. We were very, very well received by the people. We were there essentially to protect the Catholic community. Our patrols were being given hot food, soup, tea, cakes by what was, was a very, very appreciative community. When the first came in, I sort of was a bit fascinated by all these soldiers. It was like something you seen in a, a TV program. My mummy made them tea and sandwiches. And I had an older sister who was 18 at the time. And I think she was a wee bit caught up in it all. She used to go to the dances and that with them. And then she met a soldier and uh, she went off and married him. They brought in the troops in 1969 and people thought the troops were going to protect them. It took some time to find out that they were going to do nothing of the kind. 
In reality, the army had not been sent in to separate the Catholics and the Protestants. They were sent in because the authorities had lost control. Had the British government imposed direct rule right away, made clear to the Unionists that the state must be reformed and the discrimination ended, history might have been different. But they did not. The troops were sent in to restore law and order, but for Catholics it was the law and order of an avowedly sectarian Protestant state. The British army are just coming back in to restore the status quo. It was the status quo that caused the pogroms in the first place. It was the status quo that led to over 51 years of discrimination. It was a very rude awakening we got when we found that the people who were to protect us were in fact taking sides against us. I was so young at the time when I looked back. It just seemed to happen without you realizing that all of a sudden they weren't our friends anymore. In July 1970, an army weapons search in the Catholic Lower Falls area of Belfast escalated into riots. Following the IRA's early failure to adequately defend nationalist communities and after the arrival of the British Army, the organization had split and a new group called the Provisional IRA was formed initially committed to armed defence of their communities. As troops entered the falls, a small group from the Provisionals were joined by the official IRA in sporadic gun battles with nearly 3,000 troops who blanketed the area in CS gas, firing countless rubber bullets and live rounds. The British Army imposed a curfew, which went on for 36 hours. And this was a city in the United Kingdom then under military rule. The aim was to seize IRA weapons, which they did. But the searches were indiscriminate and brutal. Homes were destroyed, and the army subsequently admitted soldiers had looted Catholic homes. That's the British Army, professionals. Professional looters, professional robbers, professional thieves. Four civilians were killed by the army and at least 60 civilians and 18 soldiers injured. But as young Catholic families trapped in their homes ran out of milk and bread to feed their children, women in nationalist areas around Belfast decided to take direct action to break the military curfew. I remember bringing down two pounds of sugar my mummy had given me to carry. And when they got down into the lower falls, the army had big barbed wire things across the road. But yeah. the women just up and walked in. The British Army didn't know what hit them. They knew where we were coming, but they didn't expect so many. So the, the army ended life. up, they had to stand back and let us in and they had to let the people come out of their houses. There was nothing they could do about it because they couldn't shoot us all. So they just had to stand back. I must have been about 13 at the time. I think we were about 13. <laughs> it was a humiliating episode for the army. But as they increasingly targeted young Catholic men as IRA suspects, 
women emerged as the first line of nationalist community resistance. The development was not, apparently, welcomed by the army. Our inhibitions about women have reached absurd lengths. We, moreover, seem excessively timorous of charges of striking women. It is important to take a robust, perhaps even oriental, attitude to this problem and to lay into the women of one's area with vigor. Women will come out with bin lids and whistles and banging the bin lids on the ground when the army come in the area to warn people that they were in. These great macho people, uh, paratroopers, were finding themselves being mocked in the street. Morale was going down. You don't have women, men and children mocking paratroopers in the streets without some kind of retribution. There would have been sort of angry clashes, no verbal abuse of one another, no more mummy and other women would have been given names abuse and they'd have been given abuse back. It basically just went on like that, so you knew things weren't good. In mid-1970, the provisional IRA abandoned purely defensive actions for a bombing campaign against commercial targets. And then, in February 71, they killed the first British soldier of the Troubles. In response, hardline loyalists demanded Northern Ireland's Unionist Prime Minister, Brian Faulkner, take tougher action against the IRA. Loyalist paramilitaries, known to vastly outnumber the IRA, were looking threatening. To prop Faulkner up, the British government agreed he could introduce internment, the power to imprison indefinitely without charge or trial. The main target of the present operation is the Irish Republican Army which has been responsible for recent acts of terrorism, they are the present threat. I ask those who will quite sincerely consider the use of internment powers as evil to answer honestly this question. Is it more of an evil than to allow the perpetrators of these outrages to remain at liberty? The British Army prepared to carry out Faulkner's orders. A list of 450 people was supplied by the RUC. It contained not a single loyalist, but included many peaceful civil rights activists. Bala Murphy, seen as a hotbed of Republican activism, was a key target. The 9th of August was a terrible day. It really was. I was wakened like everyone else at four in the morning by the sound of bin lids. I remember lying in bed and I heard my daddy shouting to my mummy, Joan, Joan, get up, the bin lids are going, there's something wrong.
the army rolled into all the Catholic areas and raided houses of a list. People were just dragged from their beds. My friend was there saying, could you come with me quick? My daddy's been arrested. They raided my house. I wasn't there. So they went across the road and they arrested my father. There was whole families uh, were arrested and were held in internment. They were actually had a man chained to the back of Sarsen. And it was like something you would see in cowboys and Indians and trailing the Indians behind him. It was just unbelievable. I've lived in Portofari all my life. We didn't have much problems down this way at all. On the 9th of August, we were to go to Belfast to visit my brother, Father Hugh Mullen, who was a priest in Ballymorphy at that time. But uh, my brother phoned up and said, don't come up today because there's problems here. He lived in Springfield Park in Valley Murphy. In front of him, there was a bit of waste ground. And behind was Spring Martin, the Protestant estate. That evening, a large mob of loyalists on the road in front of the Spring Martin estate began threatening the Catholics living below in the horseshoe-shaped Springfield Park where Father Mullen lived. Springfield Park came under attack from a crowd from, from Spring Martin's loyalists, came down. They were breaking into their houses and racking the back of their homes. As the Loyalist attacks grew, residents of Springfield Park began evacuating across the wasteland in front of Father Mullen's house. A man had been taking children across the field. Bobby Clark was his name. I took a child across open ground, what we call Finley's Field. Someone took a child off me. And I explained that I was going back to help. When I ran across the open ground and I looked over my right shoulder, I noticed two soldiers on the roof on Spring Martin Road tracking me with their rifles. Dozens of soldiers from the Parachute Regiment and the Queen's Own Regiment had been stationed overlooking Springfield Park. The army snipers Bobby could see were positioned in newly constructed flats in Spring Martin and they had a perfect view over Father Mullen's house onto the open ground, across which Bobby Clark was now running. Some came in my head zigzag. And I zigzagged. Whether they shot me because I zigzagged or whether I saved my life, I don't know. I was knocked down flat. I was hit on the side, and the bullet went through the muscle on the side and acted it across my spine. People were shouting that a man had been shot, and they wanted a priest. So my brother got a, something white, and he went out. And he started waving it as he went into the field. This was seen by witnesses. Father Mullen came in to me and I said, Father, I'm not going to die. And he says, I'd anoint you anyway. And he administered the last rites to me. 
At that time, he was doing that there. My brother, Frank, had ran out to help. And uh, Father Mullen was making his way to phone the ambulance. Father Mullen was heading about 10 to 15 yards from me and cried out, just crying out of pain. He died after about 20 minutes. He was shot twice. And he lay there and he bled to death. Then they started firing, firing again, just firing. And the next minute was, crack, bang, and Bobby Clark says, he seen my brother just fall. Frank Quinn, who was lying beside me, he just jerked up and the bullet went through his skull and he was dead outright before he hit the ground. Our Frank was shot once at the back of the head. The bullet has actually was lodged on his cheek. Still lodged on his cheek. Then they fired on everybody. They just fired and fired on everybody. Just kept firing, constant firing. Earlier that day, tension had also been rising just a few hundred yards away on the Springfield Road. There, members of the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment were based in a commandeered building known as the Henry Taggart Hall, where many of the internees had been taken. Throughout the day, the women were back and forth protesting. They were up looking for their sons, looking for their husbands, brothers. As angry youths continued to attack the barracks, a large crowd of loyalists came down from Spring Martin and the nationalist rioters ran to confront them. My mummy said, uh, come on, you have to go home. We were sort of talking until her trying to keep her there because so we wanted to watch. It was like a, a show to us. And she said, no, because the Protestants would shoot you, but the army won't. But the army fired gas at the riders, and obviously we were in the middle. I couldn't see my mummy, so I said to my friend, come on quick, let's run up here and see what's going on. So we run up in the Springfield Park, and we got into it, it was chaos, but it scared me and her. We said, look, come on, maybe we should go home. Breeze's mother, Joan, unaware her daughter had gone home, tried to find her. Around the time, Father Mullen and Frank Quinn were shot. My mummy had gone up Springfield Park after me, she had met her nephew, and he had sent her back. Said, if I see her, I'll send her down to you. Joan turned back to an area known as the Manse Field, on the other side of the main road from the barracks. There, she joined a group of neighbours standing near a white gable end, watching the riot. My daddy was starting with a group of men, Davy Callahan, Dan Breen, Danny Taggart, my father was having a bit of crack, a bit of slagging. They were there, there were four or five of them was there standing. And all of a sudden, the power troopers started firing in his family across the road. And I think it moved. So this is where it happened on the Springfield Road. Just further down is Springfield Park where myself and my friend ran away. On the left, where the old folks' home is now, was Henry Taggart Barracks. There was two white pillars at the opening till the months. When the shooting started, people all gathered round trying to take cover. 
and then maybe three or four of them tried to run towards Palomorphe. Dan Breen and Wally Ward run across the field trying to get to Wally's home. He almost made it when he was shot in the back in the shoulder area. He fell to the ground and managed to crawl into his own home. My brother, Noel Phillips, was trying to make his way home across from Springfield Park. My brother was trying to escape, try to get to safety. The soldiers uh, shot him. Then he was lying on the ground screaming. He yelled out, and my father turned around. And he was shot in the leg. He had twisted and fell to the ground. Some of the survivors who were uh, behind the pillars says that my daddy was lying there. He was out in the open. And his body bounced with every bullet and threw him 14 times. They intentionally shot him again and again and again. At the same time, Noel Phillips is lying on the ground and he was screaming. Witness says, my mummy walked out, bright summer's night, bright red hair, and said, son, don't be crying, I'm going to come and help you. Now, you remember the last, when I told you earlier on in my story, the last words my mummy said to me was, the Protestants would shoot you, but the army wouldn't. And I believe my mummy walked out in the middle of that field thinking, I am a woman, they will not shoot me. The woman in the house said she heard crying. And she banged the window and said, love, go up the side of the house, I let you in the front door. And mommy said, love, I can't move, I can't see him. And she says, when my mommy turned her face, she could see half her face was missing. My mommy was shot in the face, the shoulder, the hand, the thigh. And we have witnesses said she lay there and cried. My daddy apparently tried to go towards Mrs Connolly to help. And then he was shot. He was shot in the right leg. After the people were shot, the army drove across the road and it's one side of the road to the other. Witnesses vary on the detail, but agree that an army vehicle reversed partially into the man's field and that two or three soldiers got out. The army picked up five men. They picked up Noel, Danny Taggart, Davy Callahan, George Russell. And they picked up Joe Murphy, my daddy. The five of them were taken into the barracks but left Mrs. Connolly in the field. And they said they lifted everybody and left my mummy there because she was already dead. Janet's wounded father, Joe Murphy, was later taken to hospital, where he told his wife that despite their injuries, the survivors had been beaten by the army. My daddy says they were put into what he called a darkened room. And when the army came in, the army kicked and booted them. My daddy also told my mummy that while he was in the Taggart Hall, that he was shot into his open wound. Several others had also been shot and wounded on the man's field that evening. One of them was an 11-year-old boy who suffered terrible abdominal injuries, which left him hospitalised for months.
On Finley's field, the injured and the dead still lay where they'd been shot. It was 11 o'clock that night on RTE News that I heard that a priest had been shot in Bella Morsey. They didn't need to tell me the name of the priest. I knew who the priest was. I heard this banging at the door, and I could see my father. So I opened the door, and he was crying. He was distraught. I said, Dolly, Dolly, what happened? What happened? What's, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he said to me, Frank was shot. He says, Dolly, was he wounded? He says, and he went and he sat in the stairs and he said to me, was, no, he's dead. Now, them three words have always stuck in my head. My poor mommy, when she came in, she was terrible, it was terrible. It was terrible, she was like a ghost. My mother never had a Christmas. She never ate. My father was the same, he, he, lost, his, he didn't, lost his son. It was the worst day of my life. Up to that, I had only been away, lot 14. It was the worst day of my life. morning. Um, my sister, who had married the British soldier, realised mummy hadn't come in. So her and her friend next door gone round community centres and all round the areas to see if they could find mummy. I remember my oldest brother said, go to the phone and ask, is there anyone with red hair being admitted to the hospital? My daddy came back, basically very shaken, and he said, they said there's only one woman with red hair and she's in the morgue. And it took three attempts for him to go in before he could identify her because her injuries were horrendous. And I had to look at my family crying for their mommy, my young sister, three years of age, crying for her mommy. And I'm sitting there going, why did I run, why did I run away? Why was I so nosy? On the 10th of August, we're getting told that our priest was dead, Mrs. Connolly was dead. And 14, I just stood and listened to the adults because they were in despair. Daddy called us in and said that we had to go away because it was too serious, it was too much trouble. The Republic of Ireland had opened up their army camps for refugees to come down there. So buses were leaving from our community centre. We had a youth leader, Pat McCarthy, organising these buses to come and collect women and children to get them out of the area because there was chaos. Around 7,000 refugees left Belfast for the Republic that year. We're from Belfast, Springfield Road area. And my husband just thought it would be safer for us to come here. And our priest has just been shot dead. They brought us down to um, Waterford, at uh, the bottom of Ireland. The next time we actually heard anything was me and my sister were sitting on a big long bench, we were watching the TV, and it was the last news of the night come on. It just said, uh, Joan Conley, mother of eight, was buried today. And it was like, all of a sudden, we suddenly dawned on us what was actually had happened. And the two of us got to set ourselves in a terrible state. In Ballamurphy, those left behind, fearing further incursions by loyalists or the army, prepared their defences. On the second day of the massacre, the mood in the area was very, very tense. The only thing 
that a lot of people could do, just put up barricades to prevent something similar to happen. The barricades were protection, not only against marauding gangs, but, but against the troops themselves. The barricades were seen as a direct challenge by the British Army in Belfast, and in particular by the commander of the Belfast operation, Brigadier Frank Kitson. This is him, Frank Kitson, right about the time when he first became Brigadier Kitson uh, in Northern Ireland. I'd worked personally as his clerk, while well, based with the United Nations Forces in Cyprus some years earlier. A very serious guy demanding someone you wouldn't cross. Like most senior British Army officers deployed in Northern Ireland, Frank Kitson had learned his trade suppressing anti-colonial insurgencies in the dying days of the empire. Brigadier Frank Kitson was the brains behind army policy and army attitude on the ground and everywhere else. This book, uh, Low Intensity Operations, was written by Kitson from his experiences based in Kenya uh, and in Malaya uh, uh, during the 1950s, which became the de facto doctrine for the conduct of the Northern Ireland campaign in those early years. In order to put an insurgency campaign down, one must use a mix of measures, not just military measures, and it is sometimes necessary to do unpleasant things which lose a um, certain amount of allegiance for a moment in order to produce your overall result. For Kitson and the British Army in Belfast, barricades were a symbol of failure. On day two, paratroopers supported by Royal Engineers moved in on the barricades of Bala Murphy. I reference my request for Hawkeye to uh, view these barricades. That afternoon, Eddie Doherty, a 31-year-old father of four, was walking down the White Rock Road towards one of those barricades. Eddie was my brother and he was, him and I were very close. He was just the life and soul of our party, of our house. Eddie come up to check on my father and us to see if we were all right, because he had heard it was very bad up in this area. There was a barricade just at the top of that hill as you come up the white rock there. See the, the silver gate? Well, there was a barricade there. He actually walked down the White Rock Road here on the graveyard side. He crossed over here to talk to a man called Billy Whelan, whom he knew. Mr Whelan told me that Eddie was standing having a conversation with him when the next thing he fell at his feet. At around 1700 hours on the 10th of August 1971, Edward Daggery was shot and fatally injured by a bullet fired from a soldier on the White Rack Road. At this time, the soldiers were removing a barricade uh, with a mechanical shovel. The soldier claimed he shot Mr. Daggery, whom he alleged was throwing the petrol hole. was shot in the right hand side of his back and the bullet ricocheted around his body and came out his breast. There are clear contradictions in two different accounts given by the soldier. In his initial statement uh, to the Royal Military Police, uh, he refers to amping his cartridge of bullets. He made a second statement 
um, a matter of months later, where he describes uh, one with well aimed shot. The soldier said that Eddie was a petrol bomber, but when the forensic got his body and they told my father that his body was clean, there was no residue or anything, either from a gun or from petrol bombs. You know, when you start to talk about it again, you get a bit angry and hurt that somebody's life should have been just taken away from them. He was a very handsome man. And uh, he just was one of the best. And he idolised his children, idolised them children. His wee girl, when he was putting her to bed at night. He just sang to her scarlet ribbons. You know, I know it's 47 years ago, but he was ours and it's like yesterday. So, God works in mysterious ways. See where the cross is down there? Hmm. Well, there's a bloke shot there, there, for enough. The British Army came in and murdered my brother, who was an innocent man, and they didn't realise the devastation they left behind. The devastation was far from over. Brigadier Kitson was about to dispatch his shock troops to Ballamurphy, the 1st Battalion Parachute Regiment. particular reputation in this uh, community here. They were prepared to do whatever they had to do to get the job done. Broke the rules, uh, were referred to as Kitson's own private army. If Kitson wants anything doing, he's put the powers in because they were his boys. They were the ones who were the rough it would, it would suffer. Nobody liked them. You know, we, we couldn't stand them, and they called us crap hats anyway. But we had to be as good as them. They would search houses and be hostile with people. Then we would be exactly the same. And as nationalist communities like Ballamurphy put up barricades to keep the army and the loyalists out, so one para were dispatched to demolish them and disperse the crowds. August, the soldiers, the paratroopers, came from this mountain. They came down the hill and got into position. It was the early hours of the morning. My brother John was in bed. My younger brother woke him. So him and Terry got dressed and went out. The bin lead started going, so the sister Teresa went up and said to my mummy that there was something happening. People thought it was loyalists coming over the mountain to attack the homes in Bellamurphy. That's when they seen the soldiers. The X 
actually heard the shooting. That's when everybody turned and started running. There was chaos. And people scattered. They run for their lives. Joe, my brother, and my daddy was separated. Joe actually jumped over somebody that was lying in the middle of the road. We now know that that was my daddy that our Joe um, jumped over. My brother was shot twice. The second bullet went into his thigh, his right thigh, and traveled up and damaged every vital organ in his 20-year-old body. So this is where we believe the area in which my daddy was shot. My daddy was shot in the middle of the, the road door in the back, where he was either trailed or believed to have crawled up that pathway. The soldiers was able to actually follow the trail of blood down into this garden. I was only 16 when we opened the front door. Mr. Carr was at the front gate, who was um, shot. My brother was rushing out to try and get him, but Mr. Carr said, no, I'm shot bad and I'm gonna die. Um, anyway, so don't be getting shot coming to get me. He says, get away into the house out of the road of the shooting. So we actually did close the door and run up the stairs. That's when um, the door was booted in and the soldiers run up the stairs. They grabbed me and my brother, trailed us down the stairs forcefully and brought us out and they beat us. One paratrooper um, put his rifle down to my, behind my brother's ear and they said to him if he was shot, he was dead also. The Doyle brothers were taken away and a medical orderly from one para dragged the injured Joe Corr from their garden back up the walkway towards the body of John Laverty. This male was complaining of pain in his right side. I looked at this area and saw that the contents of the abdomen were emerging from a hole in the abdominal wall. Several days after being shot, Eileen's father, Joe Corr, was transferred from the Musgrave Military Hospital, where he'd first been taken, to Belfast's Royal Victoria. He died there 16 days after his shooting. 600 paratroopers descended on Bala Murphy that day. Witnesses described raids, assaults, and indiscriminate firing of rubber bullets and live ammunition. I was getting up to pull the window, closed. The next minute, I don't know what hit me. A bullet hit me in the face, right in the head. These soldiers come in shooting at people for nothing. If they only give us a chance and explain us what's it about, they're just coming in shooting in with their guns. And there you can see it for yourself what they're doing to the innocent people. It's got nothing to do with us at all. That afternoon, Bala Murphy youth worker Paddy McCarthy loaded up a cart with milk and bread for local children trapped in their homes by the violence. He made his way down this street here, and he's calling out bread and milk for uh, babies and children. And as he got here, he was confronted by a patrol of paratroopers. The paratroopers were giving him a hard time and they were pointing rifles at him. He says, well, if you're going to shoot me, you'll shoot me face on. He backed away from the paratroopers. I have one of the statements who says one of the soldiers fired uh, over his head.
As a result, that shot being fired, Potty uh, died of a heart attack. Well, Paddy did not die from gunshot wounds. Paddy McCarthy is undoubtedly a victim of the Balmurphy massacre. A few hundred yards from the community centre, another local worker was leaving Corpus Christi Church. My father, John McCurr, served in the British Army and he lost his hand in the Second World War fighting for his country. And when he came back from that, he started up working in as a joiner. And then as a Corpus Christi church here, he was working that day. So when the father came walking around here, that's when he was shot in the head. He was shot in the right hand side. And that's when my father fell here. And he died nine days later. Some witnesses say John was shot by soldiers on patrol nearby. Others say he was shot from a local timber yard where British Army snipers were regularly stationed. The journal who's at present doing odds and ends off the new church walked around the corner and the sniper got him from the timber yard of J.P. Boyce. We're, we're, we're dying up here. We're getting murdered up here. Murdered. The raids and searches continued all day. Several people were shot and injured. The door was busted in. And it made me stand in front of it one day. And it says, we get shot, you get shot. In the back room. They used you as a shield, you Used me as a shield. More than 50 men were arrested and taken to Girdwood Barracks. Among them, John Laverty's brother, Terry, and 16-year-old Robert Doyle. There was two lanes of paratroopers and police with batons, and you had to run a gauntlet through them, and you were beat. <laughs> Any chance they got to beat you, they did. It wasn't until we came home that I had found out that um, Mr. Carr was at the front step here. And it wasn't until then that I'd found out that the Paras had cleaned all the blood away. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. I've never spoke about this before, um, since I was 16. So it's actually bringing it all back. Um, I mean, it was just so horrific and a horrific thing at that age to go through. It's horrific times. As many as 40 people had been shot 11 of whom lay dead or dying as the final day of the Ballamurphy killings came to an end. But as Ballamurphy grieved, the British Army's PR machine went to work. That same evening, the local paper covered the story. Two gunmen were shot dead, another seriously wounded in a two-hour gun battle with troops in Ballamurphy early this morning. A parachute captain said his men fought a two-hour gun battle with as many as 20 gunmen who were using Thompson submachine guns, pistols and rifles. We killed two of them and recovered the bodies, he said. My daddy wasn't an IRA gunman. That captain fed up the media with that. So people believed what they read in papers and his workmates believed what they read in the paper, and they sent my mummy hate mail. If there had been a police investigation, they would have knew my daddy wasn't an IRA gunman, because all the evidence was there. 
The civilian police, the RUC, conducted virtually no serious inquiries into the deaths, excepting the military's version of events. And that version was a product of institutional procedures, which some soldiers argue was open to abuse. You carry the yellow card, and that was the rules and your regulations for open and fire, powers of arrest. If somebody had a gun, or you believe somebody had a gun, and was about to do harm with it, you could legally open fire. The result of that meant that basically it became the norm for a soldier to respond to every, any and every situation where they opened fire with, um, and even after 40 odd years, I can still remember uh, without looking at it, that I saw what appeared to be a gunman uh, holding what I appeared, appeared to be a firearm, which I believed was about to be used against another soldier or a person whom it was my duty to protect, and I opened fire and shot at him. By saying that, regardless of what the, the reality was, the soldier would always be covered because he was acting within the instruction contained in the yellow card. A year after internment was introduced, one military commander described the yellow card in these terms. The yellow card is the umbrella to justify your actions afterwards. The more that the information passes through the system up each level, the more convinced the person passing the information on is that that is the truth. These are the reports that go from Brigade and from HQ Northern Ireland to the Information Policy Unit, to the PR unit, uh, and then subsequently come back out again in the public domain in the newspaper. And it's not only that it, this is presented as the truth, they believe it's the truth. Everything changed. Everybody's life changed. My daddy wasn't there. I took on the responsibility. Um, looking after my brothers and sisters and helping my mummy and things like that. It was very, very hard on us all. It was very hard. But I just had to continue on, as I say, and you didn't have time for grieving. And <clears throat> it was only after my mother died that everything hit me. It was, it was terrible. It really was, like, I have to say. Two years after the death of their father, John and Alice's family suffered another terrible tragedy. Their 15-year-old brother was abducted by the IRA and accused of being an informer. Bernard had learning difficulties. He was interrogated. They put a placard around his neck and Bernard was murdered. Uh, he was shot in the head and uh, left for dead. When you look the what the paratroopers done to my daddy, they are right on the same with my brother. In 2009, the IRA apologised to the family for his murder, declaring him innocent of all charges and expressing profound regret for his death. But in the mid-70s, Bernard's brutal murder reinforced the isolation, fear and trauma of those left behind. My mother went from a very hard-working woman to this wee wizened woman we didn't know anymore. Days we couldn't find her. And we searched and searched and she'd be sitting at the grave, washing the grave down. My mummy died seven years after Eddie just it deteriorated. Eddie's wife, Mary, died nine years after Eddie. 
and the children were left with no mother or no father. They've had very hard times, them kids. Very, very hard times. When my daddy was shot, I was eight. My daddy had spent two weeks in hospital, 13 days until the 22nd of August. It was my twin brother's birthday. And I remember they walked over to the city and they sat down. It was just something like in slow motion and they sat down, lifted their birthday cards and threw the birthday cards in the fire. I think it was then I realised my daddy was dead. Joe Murphy died of septicemia after suffering kidney failure and the amputation of his leg as a consequence of his injuries. Next thing I remember was the day of the funeral. Um, we were standing in the garden. And I remember me and my two sisters, we had these wee black dresses on with wee white daisies over a new dress we'd got for the funeral. And the army came down the street and they stopped outside the house. And they started singing. That the song they were singing was, Where's your papa gone? Chirpa, chirpa, cheap, cheap, something like that. It was a song that was number one in the charts. I remember my cousin, she was wanting to lift a bottle to throw at the Brits. And I remember people holding her. After the Brits drove off, we were taken, all the younger kids were taken at their house and we weren't allowed to go there for not. <laughs> that was in case there was any trouble, Mummy wouldn't let us go. So we didn't go there for not. I remember coming home. The house seemed so strange. You suddenly dawned on you, where was my mummy? Daddy was in a real bad way. He just couldn't cope. He just lay in bed, drunk, crying for his wife. For decades, the families were left to grieve alone, fearful and silenced. I thought if I told anybody, a Protestant, that my mummy was murdered and she was innocent, she was out looking for me, that they would say, ah, oh, she's only saying that her mummy must have been a gun woman because they put the statements out. So when I went into work and it was a mixed workplace, I would have just said, oh, my mummy was uh, killed in a car accident. Years later, there was an event happening in Belfast. It was called the Forgotten Victims event. The hall was packed, and after the speaker spoke, they said, if anybody wants to say anything, can stand up. People in the audience was asked if they had a loved one killed. And a man stood up and spoke about his brother being shot. He was shot on the 9th of August, 1971. His name was Frank Quinn. I wasn't for saying anything. We never spoke, we just listened. But next thing my brother stood up and he said, well, my mummy Joan Connolly was murdered on the 9th of August, 1971. Next thing, Janet Donnelly stood up. And I says, my daddy was shot on the 9th of August, 1971. And we were all looking at one another and thinking, what's going on here? So when, the, when it was over, those of us who spoke all came together. It was then I met Breach and my brother Pat, Liam Quinn, Alice Taggart. Janet came over to us and says, look, I've been trying to find out what's happening. Would you just be interested in sort of us getting together? And we said yes. Now, we had never met, but we were all 
trying to do the same thing. So we exchanged phone numbers and that was it. Although inquests were held into the deaths in 1972, they were little more than formalities and recorded open verdicts. This is the Greater Ballymurphy area. This is the, where the Finley's Field of Springfield Park. This is where Father Hugh and Frank were shot there and Bobby Clark was wounded mm -hmm. and other people was wounded as well. So then you come down Springfield Park Springfield here to the Monts. Park to the Monts there. And the Monts here is where my mummy was killed and this is the house where, the, where your daddy gave a land, yeah. We went to the areas where they were murdered and we asked people, did you live here? Could you tell us, did you remember what you seen? That must, that must have changed there on the wrong road. Everything's... People stood at their doors crying, telling us the stories nobody ever asked them before. The families have now collected statements from over 130 witnesses to the events of those three days. This was the hour of my brother. He fell to the ground. I was around about this area here. He fell to the ground, he was injured. But as far as we believe, there was, there was a, an, an army sergeant pulled up on the Springfield Road. A few soldiers got out. As far as me and my family are concerned, we believe that my brother Noah was just, I just shot dead. But we later found out the first time he was shot was, uh, wasn't fatal. He was, he was lying on the ground, injured, screaming. He was no danger to anyone. But uh, subsequently, we heard afterwards, witnesses were hiding in the field, not far away. Years later, one of those witnesses, who was just 11 at the time, described what he saw. He kept crying as he was in so much pain. One of the soldiers had a side arm gun and he pulled it out and said, fuck up, you cunt, and then shot him dead. It was a post-mortem report, I really know, that had uh, enlightened us. Most families had never seen the autopsies of their loved ones before. Noel's autopsy described two bullet wounds in the back of his head. One of the bullets had entered the left side of the neck below and behind the ear. Another bullet had entered the right side of the neck. A nine millimeter bullet was recovered, consistent with the claims Noel was shot with a pistol or sidearm. Someone's went close to him, shot him twice. Behind each ear. The only conclusion I come to is it was an execution, which I'm sure the British Army will deny. Joan Connolly was shot uh, in the face and in the right thigh, and she also had some other injuries which were uh, less serious. Significantly, Joan Connolly was left in the months in that field from 9 p.m. to shortly after 3.15 a.m. Uh, we commissioned uh, an emergency consultant expert to re-examine the evidence relating to Joan Connolly. He brought a statement out which nearly killed us to say that, yes, my mummy was shot, but not one of her wounds were fatal. If she had got first aid in the field even, she might have survived. My mummy bled to death. Are they soldier statements? The families began re-examining soldiers' statements, which were formally submitted to the original inquests in 1972. They remain the only official record of what happened, 
and they identify where the soldiers were located on the first day of the shootings. There's paratroopers on the top of the flats here that were newly constructed. There's paratroopers in the Fear Foster School in Henry Taggart, Oryx. Almost all the shots that killed the victims on day one of internment came from those three locations. But in their statements, the soldiers, identified only by code letters, claimed they were subjected to sustained enemy gunfire. This is a statement here from uh, a soldier F. I would estimate that during the short time that I was there, some 200 rounds were fired at us. This one here, Soldier I, he said 400 to 500 rounds were directed at my location. Total of between five and 600 rounds were fired on us. Soldier B, total of 700 rounds were fired at our positions. The soldiers describe a major battle, which they suggest justifies the killings. But then, in one statement, a revealing observation. See this guy here? He says, I saw gunmen firing rifle stations upstairs room of a house in Spring Martin. Well, we, we know the soldiers are in, uh, uh, in the Spring Martin. They're in Spring Martin. Several soldiers describe firing at a target in the Moyard Flats, positioned directly between the troops in Spring Martin and those in Veer Foster School. Soldier C ordered three men on the school roof to engage with the gunmen in number 21, Moriard Park. R is over here. So he is firing as well over into these flats. And they're firing into them. And they're firing into them. Well, I think a Soldier T statement is very interesting. He's firing across the field where Frank and Father Mullen is, right across over at these houses, in Drack Lane, with Faith Foster School. So they're firing at one another then? Well, that's what it looks like. It does look like, does it, doesn't it? it? At the same time, all them bullets were shot. There was no gun being found in, the, in that area, and there was no guns recovered. No guns recovered, no ammunition recovered. No so it was shells, the... even. No, nothing. Yeah. They used all them bullets just shooting at one another. So they had to. Just, just, just what summed up what Jesus says there, a soldier D, he's in Spring Martin, and then he says, because of the danger of our shot strike in the Fear Foster School, I ordered all firing to cease. Right, so he had a so fair idea. He had a fair idea. Was there shooting at each other? What was happening? As soon as you hear the firing, you get a crack in the thumb. And the crack is actually the shot that's going over your head, because it's breaking the speed of sound. The thump which follows is actually the sound of the rifle being fired with a high velocity shot. In Bally Murphy, you with your high rise block of flats are there at the time, and you have a dip, the echo would surround off the building. It'd be very, very difficult to find out where exactly that shot come from. It would be very easy for a soldier to fire and a soldier in another regiment to believe he's being fired at. And then you, he would return fire. And that's how you end up with a gun battle of two troops firing at each other when there's no IRA there. If the relative suspicions are correct, then the sustained exchange of gunfire would suggest a serious lack of command and control. But that does not explain the apparently targeted shooting several times in some instances of those who died. Three soldiers are taking responsibility for shooting her. One said she was shooting at him with a handgun and he shot her and she fell back and got up and carried on shooting. Another soldier said she was going through the grass, firing at him, and he shot her. Another one said she was sitting in the middle of the field with a machine gun, firing at him. I come on. This was a granny at 44 years of age. It was no Annie Oakley. I know my daddy was innocent, but the official version is that the army had wiped out a hardcore IRA unit. 
Where's the evidence? But the army do say that there were a large number of IRA gunmen in the area. Were there any IRA people firing? Well, when we went out years later and trying to find out, to find witnesses, to find out what actually happened, I remember we were in my yard and we were talking to a couple of women in my yard and we'd asked that question, was there IRA men out on the 9th of August? The women went, IRA men? Some of them showed up the following day. We chased them out of the estate. We asked them where they were last night when our people were being murdered by the army. There was no IRA men here protecting us. No one can say for certain if any paramilitaries were present. The loyalist UVF did recently claim it had a gunman in the area shooting at Catholics. But the IRA said they had been tipped off about internment and most of their members had evacuated. The families believe there is no convincing evidence to support the army's claim they faced large numbers of IRA gunmen. Kits and women at Valley Murphy, I believe, to give a lesson to, to the people of Valley Murphy, saturate it with troops to show who's boss, to teach them a lesson. You don't mess. This is what you'll get every time. I believe the soldiers knew who they were shooting because they had threatened her loads of times. In fact, actually, a couple of weeks before that, we were standing, playing at the door, and Mummy was brushing their path, and the soldiers drove past, and they were shouting abuse at her. She was shouting back at them, and the soldiers shouted, there's a bullet in here, and it's for you. Part of the, of the building the fear of a community um, in training was all about being aware, being careful, um, don't trust the Catholics, basically. Instead of trying to communicate with them, the average family, it was just to treat them all the same, whether the Republican, nationalist, or just an ordinary Catholic family. You dehumanise them. They're nothing. They're just Catholics, and that's it. They're our enemy. And if Catholics were the enemy, Bala Murphy was the enemy's heartland. From 1971 onwards, specialist ranges were constructed. All the, the streets have been given British names and, and English names, and the map itself is clearly marked Killy Murphy. Um, with its obvious associations. And if you actually look at the, the pictures, uh, you need to do a double take to realise that you weren't actually looking at a street in Bally Murphy. She was almost identical. And so it became a war. British Army tactics in Belfast had given moral force to the IRA. Nationalists and even most Catholics now regarded the army as the enemy, just as the army now regarded them. All those three days did, apart from take innocent people's lives, was make the community stronger and turn more and more people towards the IRA. If you complain about this or say about this, it's only IRA propaganda. Uh, we're going to tell you something. There's everybody around here doing a main need to be an IRA, man, but they'll definitely support it now. But the army in Belfast showed few signs of understanding what they'd done. Seventy miles away in Derry, things were a little different. There, army and police commanders were adopting a rather more conciliatory approach, even leaving the defensive barricades of Free Derry intact. The officer class in Belfast was openly disapproving. As General Sir Mike Jackson, then a young captain in one para, later recalled, The 1st Battalion had helped to ensure that there were no no-go areas in Belfast and a certain contempt was felt for such areas existing elsewhere in the province.
just five months after the Ballamurphy killings, the British Army sent one para from Belfast to Derry to help control a huge anti-internment march. The people running the Derry operation, the army, were aghast at, at the idea of the uh, para one going in and policing, uh, in inverted commas, this demonstration because they knew what the first para regiment were about. They knew their sort of record. They knew what they'd done in Ballamurphy. Um, so they didn't want them there. At the end of that march, in less than 20 minutes, one para shot dead 13 innocent people. A 14th died four months later. The day became known as Bloody Sunday. Just as they did at Ballamurphy, army spokesmen immediately claimed the victims included gunmen, and bombers as well. One of the sources for that discredited claim was one Paris press officer, Captain Mike Jackson. And it was not the first time Captain Jackson had issued such a statement. Do you know who the captain was who told the press that John Leverty and your dad were gunmen? No. Um, you might be interested in seeing this book um, it's the autobiography of uh, General Sir Mike Jackson, um, who became Chief uh, of Staff of the British Army. And there's a bit in it where he describes what happened uh, in, uh, in Ballymurphy that day. When dealing with the barricaded Ballymurphy estate, the battalion fought a fierce gun battle with an estimated 20 gunmen. I was just around the corner dealing with the press. <laughs> so is this, is this the man then that gives the media the information that my daddy was an IRA gunman? This is clearly the implication of that. General Sir Mike Jackson? No. I bet you he's won medals and stuff and they should just be taken off him because he doesn't deserve them and he, he shouldn't be even called a general. He doesn't even deserve to be called a soldier. After Bally Murphy and then Bloody Sunday, the pattern was set. 1972 became the most violent year of the Troubles. Killing by all sides grew. In July, just a few hundred yards from Ballamurphy, five more unarmed people were shot dead in Spring Hill. Among them, a 13-year-old girl and a priest, a colleague of Father Mullen. When we lost another priest, Noel Fitzpatrick, again, it was the same thing. Catholic priests being killed was something that happened in Latin America. Uh, killing priests wasn't on the menu for a long time in Ireland. And then all of a sudden it happened. The violence continued for 30 years. More than three and a half thousand people died and tens of thousands were injured before the Good Friday Agreement finally brought an end to the troubles in 1998. And with peace, has come the search for the truth. In 2011, after years of campaigning, the Ballamurphy families finally won the promise of a renewed inquest into the deaths. An inquest cannot establish criminal responsibility, but it can establish whether the force used was justified or not. For the families, that would be a start. 
But even before the formal hearings have begun, the MOD has been criticised by the coroner for delays in supplying important information requested by the court. It makes me so angry that we have to take to the streets to get to the truth. But that's why we're here today, to make our voices heard. It's clear the new inquest could have serious implications for the MOD and the government. We have taken great inspiration and hope from the Bloody Sunday relatives for the way they have campaigned for the truth, which resulted in their loved ones being declared innocent. It took 40 years of campaigning before the official inquiry into Bloody Sunday, the most expensive in British history, found the victims innocent. But that inquiry also considered another very serious charge, that the army sent one para to Derry knowing what they were likely to do, or even intending that they should do it. The inquiry rejected that claim. We are of the view that neither of these propositions can be sustained. The government and the army command were off the hook. Saville said they were not to blame for Bloody Sunday. But if the truth is now told about what happened in Bala Murphy, the official history of Bloody Sunday and what followed may have to be rewritten. In my view, Bloody Sunday was entirely predictable. The evidence was there from the three days of violence in Bala Murphy. The evidence was in the hands of the senior military officers. If steps had been taken to look at what happened in Bally Murphy, admit what had gone wrong, Bloody Sunday would never have occurred. And if Bloody Sunday would never have occurred, I would suggest many more deaths after that would never occur. There is a demand for justice, but it is motivated, dear friends, by love, not vengeance. It's love for your relatives. Young Frank Quinn, Father Mullen, Joan Connolly, Joseph Murphy, Noel Phillips, Daniel Taggart, Eddie Doherty, Joseph Corr, John Laverty, Paddy McCarthy and John McCurr. It's not a matter of rewriting history. We're just trying to ratify history. It has to be told. The truth has to be told, warts and all. And I think people don't realise everybody's pain's the same. A soldier gets shot, his parents and his family's pain's the same as mine. What makes people think that their pain's any worse than mine or any less than mine? We're all suffering the same thing. So the truth needs to be told. That's the only way you can draw a line on the past. Tell the truth. I know my brother's innocent. We know that other people are innocent. And I would like the British government to know that we will never stop, because we will have our day in court. <laughs>